It is one o'clock, and we'll. I've got the got it set up so people can join us um, as they need to. But we're going to go ahead and and kick this thing off. Uh, welcome uh, for everybody. Uh, I see we've got Mazaharo, Justin, Jack, Brianna, and Danielle. Um, welcome to my uh, webinar. And I'm going to start out by sharing a screen. We're going to start talking about basic engine um, operation today. And we will um, wind up, end up uh, finishing and talking about engine condition diagnosis. So um, uh, come on. Can, there we go. Can everybody see the, the presentation of engine design? Give me some feedback. Can you see that or not? Yes. Okay, fine. good. Looks good. All right, so we're going to talk, start talking about engine design. <clears throat> and I, I hope you can see this animation. Um, I love this animation. I use it a lot. I wish I could slow it down so we could look at this. This shows you in a real good animation all the four strokes and really what, what happens inside the engine. Um, number one stroke, when the piston comes down, it, the cylinder turns blue, and that, that represents air that actually should be coming in. Um, Number one is the intake stroke. And you can see the intake valve. This is the intake valve here to the left. You can see that open up. Actually, that's the exhaust valve. I got that backwards. This is the intake valve. Uh, when the intake valve opens, air comes in through here and fills the cylinder. We add some fuel. Uh, we compress it. We spark the spark plug. Okay. I wish we could slow this down, but we'll talk about each individual stroke here in a minute. This engine that we just saw uh, was invented by a guy named Nicholas Otto uh, back in 1876. So that's, oh man, that's a bunch of, that's 150, that's a lot of years ago. Um, I can't do the math in my head that quick. But uh, Nicholas Otto is credited with um, designing and building the first operating engine that that we know of today. And shortly after he designed it, it was incorporated into a motorcycle. The, Nicholas Otto was a German and he, uh, he, he was buddies with uh, the Benz, uh, the Daimlers and the Benzes uh, of the Mercedes Benz uh, fame. And they incorporated the engine into a motorcycle. It made sense because the main mode of transportation back then was actually bicycle. A lot of people think it was horse and buggy, but in uh, in cities, in urban areas, um, horses, it didn't, didn't make sense to keep a horse, uh, but it did make sense to have a motorcycle, or uh, excuse me, a bicycle. So it, it made sense to motorize a bicycle because that was the main mode of transportation. These early engines back then were very crude. They did not know metallurgy. They did not know machining tolerances. They didn't know anything that uh, not, most of the things that we've learned since then. And there weren't any gas stations. <clears throat> you could not because there was no need for gasoline. Gasoline, you know, the gasoline invention, engine hadn't been invented yet. And the fuel that Nicholas Otto used was very poor by today's standards. It was more like kerosene. Um, and why, why kerosene? Well, that's what they used to light their homes back in 1876. Electricity was not in everybody's home. There was no need for it because the light bulb hadn't been invented yet. Okay, so um, consequently, diesel or diesel kerosene fuel was the fuel that was available at the time. And he figured out how to use that as a fuel to burn in an engine. Now, if you filled up your, your car today with kerosene, it wouldn't run very good. 
Matter of fact, you would be lucky to make it run at all. I, I think you would have a hard time even getting it to start on kerosene because it, it's, our engines are too high a compression for kerosene fuel today. So the engines back then, the very first engines, were very low compression, and the power output of the engines was very poor because the compression was poor. It, it, they didn't have a lot of compression ratio in the engine, and they didn't make a lot of power. All right, they were big, they were heavy, they didn't make a lot of power, they were not fast. Okay, here's a picture. Here's what Nicholas Otto looked like. And this on the right here is what the picture of his first engine looked like. Again, big, heavy, doesn't really look much like an engine. But nonetheless, that's what, the, that's what we're looking at. That's a first auto cycle engine. Okay. Um, and we give that name, auto cycle, O-T-T-O, -T -T -O, for Nicholas Otto. That's where his, it's part of his name. Gottlieb Daimler. Um, again, from the Daimler-Benz era, wooden bicycle. The auto cycle engine is not the only gasoline engine burning design. There are other designs, such as the Miller cycle, the Atkins cycle engine, and a Wankel or a rotary engine. And the Wankel or the rotary engine uh, was kind of made popular by the, the good people at Mazda. For uh, since the mid 70s, uh, Mazda had rotary powered cars and trucks, small cars, small trucks. And the last uh, rotary engine produced by Mazda was for the RX 8 which is no longer in production. That was a high performance car. And um, the Wankel or the rotary engine had some trouble meeting emission standards. And so I don't think you're gonna see any modern cars with a rotary engine, uh, but, but they are designs from the past, uh, but they, they all burn gasoline. And then of course there are diesel engines that, that fall into a little different category, which is a compression ignition engine. And we'll talk a little bit more about ignition here in a second. The first stroke of a four-stroke engine is the intake stroke. The intake stroke takes place when the piston, I'm going to stop the sharing here for a second. I've got a, a piston and connecting rod in my hand. The piston is going to start out at the very top of the bore. And we're going to call that top dead center. We're going to abbreviate top dead center. We're going to call it TDC. TDC is when the piston's all the way up as far in the bore as it's going to go. And on the intake stroke, the piston travels from the top of the cylinder to the bottom of the cylinder. Okay. And it's going to pull in air and fuel at the same time in the right ratio. Okay. And the, the piston, this piston is sealed up in that metal cylinder. And uh, let's see, I've got, a, I've got a cylinder to look at over here. We'll bring that over so we can see. <clears throat> ah, if I can get this over here. Aim my camera down just a little bit. Okay, here's the cylinders. The pistons are gonna ride up and down. It's a metal tube. And that piston is gonna ride up and down in that cylinder, okay? Aluminum piston. The cylinder in this block is a, a cast iron. And there are sealing rings that go in these grooves. They're metal sealing rings. And here's another piston. And this piston has the sealing rings in place. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and take one of these off and we'll take a look at the seal ring. Launch it across the room. Okay. Here's the metal ring that does the sealing between the piston and the cylinder wall. 
Again, metal cylinder, metal piston, metal ring. No rubber, no plastic, no ceramics. It's all, it's all metal. And the ring has a gap here that when you compress it in the cylinder, the gap gets real small. And that gap is pretty important. We'll talk more about that in the future when we talk pistons and rings. But that's what keeps the, when that piston travels down, it creates suction in the cylinder. Well, at the same time, we're going to have the intake valve open. And let's go back to the presentation. Oh, I need to share. Hold on. Share. Here we go. Looking at my picture here is this blue intake valve is going to be open while the piston is going down. And that's going to allow air from the air cleaner and the throttle body to enter the cylinder. Okay, we're going to fill that cylinder with a mixture of air and gasoline that's going to be very combustible. It's going to light on fire very, very easy. All it takes is a, a little bit of help. All we need is a spark. And this, this mixture is going to want to burn. And when it burns, it expands. And when it expands, it creates pressure. And it's the pressure that we need in the engine to drive that piston uh, and we'll talk about that on the power stroke here in just a second so the piston travels from the top of the cylinder up here to the bottom fills the cylinder with air and then we're going to close this valve and what that does is it traps this air and fuel mixture right in the chamber in that cylinder and and we'll call that the intake stroke that's the first of four strokes and it takes a half of a turn of a crankshaft, the, the shaft down here that, that moves the piston, we'll call that the crankshaft. It takes a half turn of that crankshaft in order for the intake stroke to happen. The next, the next stroke is the compression stroke. Okay, the compression stroke happens when the piston is all the way down at the bottom and now it's going to travel up to the top. And the valves are both closed, which means that that air is trapped. It can't go anywhere. And it's got gasoline there with it. And it's very, very, you know about gasoline if you've ever tried to light a bonfire with gasoline. Gasoline is very combustible. It, it, wants, it lights on fire very easily. And we're going to squeeze that air and fuel we're going to compress it the piston is going to seal in that cylinder we're going to compress it and just before we get to the top of the cylinder we're going to fire the spark plug and that starts the combustion process and it's it's interesting to note that we start that fire we we light it on fire before we get to the top now, how much before? Well, we'll discuss that in here in just a minute. But the compression stroke uh, takes another half turn of the crankshaft. 180 degrees is half a turn. And it'll, the piston will travel from bottom dead center, or the bottom of the bore, to the top of the bore. Okay? The next the ignition event is going to take place on the compression stroke. Well, when do we want the ignition to take place? Well, it varies. It varies greatly based on engine speed and engine load. Um, so it depends on how fast the engine is turning and how much power we need out of the engine. It will depend on when we make that spark plug spark. Generally speaking, ignition timing increases. In other words, we'll spark earlier with engine speed. You know, so the faster the engine is turning, the earlier we need the spark to happen before the piston hits top dead center. When there are heavy loads on the engine, we'll decrease the time. That it, uh, so it'll, the, the spark event will happen when the piston is closer to the top of the compression stroke. 
Why do we need that? Well, gasoline, a lot of people think that gasoline explodes. Well, it doesn't. It burns at a very fast rate. And it takes a few milliseconds for the combustion process to take place. And we want the pressure to push that piston back down on the power stroke. And we want that pressure to happen just at the right time. So timing when the spark occurs is very critical in these engines. Okay. Here's a picture um, of an engine, actually of a, of a steering wheel in a very, very early car. I took this over at the Stahl Museum uh, over in New Haven, and I love this picture because the driver of the car, of these early cars, he had a lot to do besides just steer and brake and accelerate the uh, engine. Here on the, you see this lever on the right-hand side of the steering wheel or a column. The driver had to control the ignition timing of when the spark occurred. By moving this lever, he could advance the, the spark, or if he pulled it down this way, he could retard the spark. So if the engine were running fast, he would need to push it up. If the engine were under a lot of load, he might need to pull it back down. Um, today's cars, obviously, you don't have a lever on your steering wheel to control engine timing. Um, and I've never driven a car that had this feature, by the way. Uh, this was all the cars I've ever driven. The, the engine takes care of it for you. But the early engines didn't. And then some of the other things here is this part here adjusted the mixture of how much gasoline it added. And this other mixture over here, this is really the accelerator, the throttle, which would be on the floor for us today. But how fast the engine ran is controlled by this lever here on the left. Kind of interesting. It really meant that the driver had to have a lot of knowledge and a lot of skill in order to operate this vehicle. Unlike today, all you need to know is where to put the gasoline in the car and how to push the button or turn the key and make it run. And you can pretty much, the, the rest of these functions are all handled by the car itself. Not so on early cars. Later, there's no lever, no, get rid of the lever on the, the steering column. They, they developed a system like this that it was centrifugal. It's all mechanical that uh, now uh, as the engine speeds up, it changes the ignition timing. This is called a distributor. And this is what I grew up working on and learning about. And uh, it is no longer used today. Okay, this is uh, uh, the next step. It took the control away from the driver, and it put it in the hands of uh, the engine. Okay, it, the engine now takes care of that. Today's engines. Today's engines, here's, here's how we control ignition timing today, is we use a computer and a sensor and a, a, a ring on the crankshaft somewhere, and we'll time that, we'll make that spark happen perfectly by using a computer. You will learn more about, though, don't worry about the, uh, the concept here. You'll learn a lot more about this when you take the fuel uh, and fuel injection and engine control classes. We'll teach you a lot more about this, but I just wanted to at least bring the subject up today. Uh, you'll learn more about this in the future classes. All right, we'll keep going. The power stroke, the next stroke in the sequence is the third stroke. It also takes a half a turn of the crankshaft. You'll notice that all four of these strokes, each stroke takes a half a turn or 180 degrees. And what happens here is with both valves closed, now we've got combustible air and fuel in the cylinder. We've already started on fire. And when we started it on fire, it wants to burn and expand and create pressure. And this is the magic. This is what we need to happen is that all the pressure that's trapped in the cylinder drives that piston down and applies force on it. When we do that, 
it makes the crankshaft want to spin. That's what sustains the crankshaft movement, and that's what that's how the engine produces its power by burning that air and fuel that we've trapped in this combustion area up here. Okay, once the piston gets down to the bottom of this cylinder, we'll start the exhaust stroke. And on the exhaust stroke, the piston travels from the bottom back up to the top. But now we're going to open the second valve, this exhaust valve, and we're going to let that piston push the burnt fuel and burnt air, the, the used up air and fuel, will go out the exhaust, and it's going to find its way into the muffler and out the tailpipe. Okay, that and through a catalytic converter and so on and so forth. So the, this is the fourth of the four strokes. Then the next stroke is back to the intake stroke. So it happens all over again. Now, I said each stroke was 180 degrees or half a turn. Well, if you look at half a turn plus half a turn plus half a turn plus half a turn, that crankshaft, in order for all these four strokes to happen, that crankshaft has turned twice. It's gone around two full times. Now, it doesn't matter who made the engine. It could be a Hyundai. It could be a Mercedes. It could be a Ford, Chrysler, Honda, Fiat, you name it. They all work this way. The engines all, these all the four strokes are the same, regardless of who made the engine. Okay, so the things that you learned today, oh, and by the way, your lawnmowers and motorcycles and tractors and generators, anything that burns gasoline works on this exact same principle, regardless of who made it. Okay, so thinking about everything that I've told you so far, in a four-stroke engine, and let's say it's idling. It's turning at 600 RPM. How often does a valve, an intake valve or an exhaust valve, open? And, and we'll just talk about a one-cylinder engine like this one here. If this engine is operating at 600 RPMs, how many times in a minute does this one valve open and close? Can anybody... Answer that. I'm looking for some input here. I'm open your mics, unmute yourself, give somebody somebody shout out and answer. Hello, is anybody there? I'm here, I'm thinking. Okay. The engine makes it, it think about it for a second, six hundred RPMs. The, the, the end of the crankshaft is going to revolve or go around 600 times in a minute. And I already said that it takes two full revolutions to do all four strokes. So in a minute's time, how many times is that one valve going to open and close? It would be 300. Yes. Yeah, perfect. Exactly. It's going to open and close 300 times in a minute. It takes two full, here's my answer, it takes two full revolutions of the crankshaft to complete one cycle. Each valve opens once, so it's 600 divided by 2 equals 300 times per minute. And let's look at that, let's divide that by 60 to see how many times in a second the engine is idling at 600 RPMs, that valve opens and closes five times in one second. That's a 1,001, and it opens and closes five times. That, if you think about it, is incredible. That happened, that's fast. It opened and closed five times in the blink of an eye. Now I want you to think about the engine not running at 600 RPM, but 6,000 RPM, close to the maximum speed of an engine. 
at 6,000 RPMs, that valve, that same valve opens and closes, not five times, but 50 times in a second. All right, I, I want you to keep that in mind when we start looking at the parts. We're gonna take cylinder heads apart and look at the valves in class. But I want you to think about that valve opening and closing 50 times in one second when you look at the parts. Now those parts, they got to be pretty good in order to last for that to happen. Somebody is trying to call me. I keep getting the same number calling me over and over and over again. All right. So the question is, as a technician, oh, where do we start? If I have an engine that doesn't run or it doesn't run correctly, how do I get it to, how do I figure it out? All right, how do I get it to run? Well, the answer is through some diagnostics. We start with some basics. We need engines have to have these three things to run. We have to be able to compress the air and the fuel. We have to have a spark to start the fire. And we have to get air and gasoline into the cylinder in the right ratio. We got to get just the right. It takes way more air than it does fuel. It takes 14 parts of air to one part fuel in order to be good and combustible. And technicians starting out in our business often make mistakes of assuming that the problem, why the engine won't run, are caused by high-tech problems. They, they hook up scanners. They look for sensors. They do all kinds of crazy things. And I'm going to tell you that to, to diagnose an engine, you, you need to start with some basics. Here are, here are, here's my simple diagnostics that I want you to try and remember. Um, because one of the most challenging things as a beginning technician is to try and figure out what went wrong, why the engine won't run. And here's, if you follow what I tell you, you will find that things will become a lot easier to figure out why doesn't this engine run, okay? The first one that I want to know is does the engine have spark? Is the spark plug sparking at all? And generally, and I'm going to stop sharing here for just a second. I want you to see my camera. I've got some tools here that I've got laid out in my little kit. And we're going to look at this tool is a spark tester. It looks like a spark plug, but it's got a, uh, a clamp, a clip welded on it, and it doesn't have an electrode. The electrode is buried way down deep and there's no little grounding strap. It takes a lot of spark energy to spark this thing. So what we do is we take the ignition wire loose and put it on here, or we take the coil and put it here with the coil still hooked up. We ground this to something grounded and we observe here while we crank the engine. And if I don't see spark, well, that tells me what I need to fix. You got to have spark or the engine will not run. But if I see spark, it, and I don't test all the cylinders, I just test one. Because if, <laughs> if one cylinder has spark, that one cylinder should cough, fart, pop, do something to try and make the engine run. And... I want to verify just that I have spark at least on one cylinder. And if it, if it does have spark, then I'm going to move on to the next thing to look for. Okay. I'm going to go back to sharing and we'll look at my screen. The next one is, do we have, uh, are we getting fuel? Is fuel getting into the cylinder? And I have some more tools here that will tell us whether or not fuel is getting into the cylinder. Number one, 
This is a fuel pressure gauge. When we try to start the engine, the fuel pump turns on and pressurizes and, and sends fuel pressure to the fuel injector. And this gauge, I hook it up to the fuel rail and it will tell me whether or not the fuel pump is pumping fuel and do I have fuel to deliver to the fuel injector, okay? That doesn't tell me that the injector is working, but it will tell me that the pump in the tank is working. And I'll, I'll tell you this, that the fuel pumps in the, inside the fuel tank are not very reliable. Sometime during the life of the vehicle, there's a good chance that you may have to put in a replacement pump. Uh, they fail a lot, and it doesn't matter who manufactured the car or the pump, because the fuel uh, fuel can be pretty nasty um, and contaminated and have other problems. Uh, fuel pumps don't live, uh, they don't always live very long lives. So fuel pressure is a real concern. You want to make sure that the engine is developing fuel pressure when you're trying to start it. That's a great tool to have in your toolbox. The next tool is this. This is a little blinky light. It's, a, it's got two little pins, okay? You see that? And there's a little tiny light bulb inside here, all right? And what we do is we unplug the fuel injector, and we're going to plug this piece in place of the fuel injector. And then I'm going to crank the engine, and what should happen if everything is right, I should watch this little light bulb flash on and off as I crank the engine. And what that does is it tells me that the computer in the car has the ability to make the injector pulse on and off to spray fuel into the engine. So between these two tools, I'm going to use these pressure gauge and a, this is called a noid light. I'll use these two tools to determine, am I getting fuel? Got to have fuel and I got to have spark. All right, I verified spark using this. Now I'm verifying that I have fuel. If I have spark and I have fuel, what else could be the problem? Well, the next step there is compression. Do I have compression? And, you know, we're moving on to um, other other uh, diagnostics from there that we're going to be doing in class. Do we have compression? And is the spark happening at the right time? Um, some of you who were in class yesterday, last night, we started doing compression testing on an engine. And we'll do more of that later in the week, and we'll do more of it again next week. So we'll get everybody through the exercises on being able to measure to see does the engine have compression how much is it good is it bad uh where where might the problems be okay and these are the tests we're going to do a cranking compression a running compression leak down test we're going to do these in class some of you like brianna you did it last night and i hope this helps um helps you understand a little bit better about what you were doing last night uh by now us talking about the four strokes. So what can a compression test tell us? Well, if the cylinder has low compression, um, we know that we have maybe a, a cylinder that's miss that might miss, misfire, or a cylinder that might not run, okay? Uh, leak down test is another test, but it, it helps us pinpoint where the loss of compression is. And that's the end of this part of the uh, presentation. I'll open it up to some questions before we jump into the next part of the presentation. Anybody have any questions? All right, if there aren't questions, we're going to go ahead and... Actually, I need to close a presentation, so bear with me. I do have a question. Go ahead. I'm listening. But it's about something else. I'm so sorry. It's so okay. When I was in your class last week, 
um, you gave me a paper and it says the time and day that will come. So do we have, we're only doing um, Zoom meeting every Wednesday and no class or we do still have class every Tuesday? Okay. We are, I will do these Zoom meetings once every week till we're done. Every so Wednesday at one o'clock, we're going to have another discussion like this where we're going to talk about whatever the topic is. Okay. Until, so, okay, so you get do, that. Yes. Yeah, so we do have class every Tuesday, right? Well, uh, you're in the Tuesday class. Yes, I, I you got to remember, I'm teaching two sections of this class. I'm teaching one on Tuesday and one on Thursday. So in the Tuesday, you are, I gave you a schedule for the days that you are going to come to class. It's going to be every other week that you're going to come to class on Tuesday nights. Okay, so the ones with the X's on, we don't, I don't go, right? No, the X's are when you do come. Oh, <laughs> Okay, because yeah, if, if there's time. an X on, the, on that date, means that's the date you are going to come. Okay. Yes, I expect it, it, and yours will be next week, correct? Yes, the 29th, I believe. Yes. Yep, right. Okay. La yesterday was the 22nd. We all got together yesterday, and then your group. See, I can't have 18 students in the classroom at one time. Right. The governor will, will get really mad at me. I can't do that. Uh, the college will be mad at me. So I got to split you up. So I can only have nine at a time. And we did nine last night. And we'll do nine next Tuesday night. Gotcha. So you will, you'll come to that. You'll come to the classroom every other week. So that means you will only, I'll only see you six times in the classroom. Okay. But you'll, we'll get together every week this way. And, and talk back and forth. Okay, I get it now. Okay, good. Well, and that's a great question because now everybody who's listening got the same thing or everybody who watches this. Okay, uh, let's see, condition. No, we wanna to go to engine classification and design. Can everybody see that screen? Engine designs. The, uh, the picture I'm showing you here is a Ferrari. This is a Ferrari V12 engine, and there's a lot of stuff. If you look at this picture, there's a lot of stuff going on here with the Ferrari V12 engine. You got down here, let's, let's look at some of the components. Down here is an alternator. That's the charging system. Over here, that's the air conditioning compressor. That makes, the, the, makes you comfortable in the car. And you got a belt that drives all of that and all of this. But you got these other belts here. There's a, a shaft here, a shaft there, and another, cup, another one here, and another one there. These are the camshafts. The camshafts in this engine that open and close the valves are driven by a belt. I, it's a pretty cool looking engine. It's kind of a busy picture, but I thought, you know, it's a good place to start. Lots of different terms that we use on engines, and don't, don't be overwhelmed. You'll learn what these mean. As a matter of fact, the first one we've already talked about. TDC means top dead center, and BDC is bottom dead center. TDC means the pistons is, is all the way up at the top. Uh, BDC means it's all the way at the bottom. Boy, I am getting just a ton of spam calls today. <clears throat> um, bank angle, firing order, uh, how we deliver fuel, cam phasing, VVT, variable valve timing. These are all terms, as we go through the course, you're going to learn more about these things. Uh, so don't, don't let the list overwhelm you, but these are all terms that you'll, you'll learn more about as we go on in the course. Okay? We're going to talk about spark ignition engines in this class. Um, there are diesels. Diesels don't have spark plugs. Don't need spark plugs. They run. They can run without them, because we call a diesel engine a compression ignition engine. We squeeze the air so tight that it becomes hot, 
and will start the fire all by itself. We rely, that's, that's called compression ignition. And that's a different design from what we're studying today. Here is a, a very early combustion chamber design. We call this a flathead engine or an L head. The valves are in the cylinder block. The piston rides up and down in the cylinder and compresses the air up here above the valve. And then the air flows in through one valve and out through another valve just like it. Okay, this is very similar to a, a lawnmower engine today. A lot of lawnmower engines use this type of technology. Uh, we used to build cars like this, but we found out we found better ways to make things happen. Here's a T-headed engine, <coughs> and this basically puts a, a valve on either side of the cylinder, piston in the middle, and again, we compress the air up here at the top. Um, and, and again, this is not a design we use anymore. Modern engines, uh, we found a much better way that we're, we'll look at here in a minute. Here's a, a next step between a modern engine and a, an older design. It's an F head, one valve in the cylinder head. Up here is the cylinder head. Down here is the engine block. Another valve here. So the air might come in this valve and then go out through the exhaust through this valve. <coughs> Still not the best design. A guy named Buick, I, I, I bet you didn't really know that there really was a man named Buick. Buick is a division of General Motors, and there was a guy named David Dunbar Buick that started Buick, and he was the first division of GM. He developed the modern cylinder head, by far the best technology around, back in 1905. And it took a long time for it to catch on because he patented it and he would not let anybody use his design unless he got money. So consequently, the, the modern design that we use today uh, was around for a very, very long time, but it didn't catch on because of David Dunbar Buick kind of wanted to make a lot of money. So. That's a little bit of trivia. And by the way, this red car is a Buick. Um, it is a race car, 1905. And if you wanted to see this race car today, it is located at the Sloan Museum in Flint, Michigan. And I have a good friend of mine who drove this car at a Buick event uh, not too awfully long ago. That's a real car. It runs and it is pretty doggone cool seeing it's a 1905. Okay, modern combustion chamber design. I'm gonna stop sharing and we're gonna look at a cylinder head. <clears throat> okay, I've taken a cylinder head and I took it to the bandsaw. Let me get some of this other stuff out of here. I took a cylinder head and we're gonna look at the valves that open and close and let the air in and out of the cylinders. Okay, I took it to the bandsaw and I cut it. So I just have a little piece of the cylinder head. This is the exhaust port. This hooks up to the exhaust system. Goes to a manifold, then to a muffler, and out the tailpipe. So the gases leave the engine here. And here's the exhaust valve. The valve... Oh, I can't open and close it. That one has got a big spring on it. I can't push that one open, but this one will open. This is the intake valve. I can push that one open. You can see how that valve opens. When that valve opens, air is allowed to come in through here, and it goes through here, and open. when that valve opens, now the air can go into the cylinder. Okay? You can see how that happens. And, and I cut away the part that you, you know, the rest of the cylinder head here. So you can see what goes on. All right. So that's, this is a modern cylinder head. Both the valves are in the cylinder head. 
and not in the block. We used to put them in the block for many, many, many years, but this is a much more efficient design. Uh, works better. It's good for emissions. for lots of good reasons why this is the way we do it today. All right, let's go back to the screen share. <clears throat> um, you've heard about hemispherical engines. You've heard about Hemis. If you know anything about cars at all, cars and trucks, you'll know that Chrysler builds Hemi engines. Well, Hemi is not a Chrysler product. It's a, they, they, they trademarked the name, um, but they didn't trademark the design. The design is a, really based on the combustion chamber of the engine. And I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Yeah, there are other manufacturers who make hemispherical engines that could still be called Hemis. This design that I just showed you is a wedge. The, the design of the quad four, or excuse me, the uh, Ecotec engine that we're gonna look at looks like a Hemi, but it has four valves. That's called a pent roof. And then we have a bowl and piston. Most engines today are one of these four designs for combustion chambers for cylinder heads. Why? Well, because they work pretty good. Here's what I just showed you. This is called a wedge design. You look at the area left over when the piston's at TDC, there's just a little pie-shaped area in here for the air to, to stay. Uh, we compress all the air and the fuel into this small, small area, and then we use the spark plug to start it on fire. And then it expands and pushes this piston back down. Okay, here is a hemispherical design. This is a Hemi engine, and you've probably seen that with Chrysler's products. And the combustion chamber isn't that pie shape like this. Now it's kind of a, well, it's actually more like a bowl, like a ball cut in half. It's called a hemisphere. And a Hemi engine has one intake valve and one exhaust valve per cylinder. Okay? And this is what the, you know, it'll have one valve on one side. And here's the port that allows the air in or out. And here's the valve on the other side that lets the air in or out. One will be the intake, one will be the exhaust. This is a pent roof design. It looks a lot like the Hemi, but we said that the Hemi engines only had two valves. Well, the pent roof is very similar, but it has two intake valves. These would be the intakes here and here, and two exhaust valves. So a pent roof design has at least, uh, at least four valves. It could have up to five valves or more if they could fit them in there. And the, the more valves, that we put in a cylinder head, or the bigger the valve, that means the more air that we can allow to come in and out of the engine. And an engine is an air pump. You know, the more air we can get into an engine, the more power the engine can make. It's all about moving air and not fuel. Fuel is easy to put in. Air is more difficult to get in and out of the engine. And we do use things like superchargers and turbochargers to move air more efficiently into and out of the engine. And that's what they, they are basically a turbo or a supercharger is an air compressor that pushes the air into the engine and allows more air to make, to go in and therefore we make more power. Okay, so it's all about air and that's why we put more valves in an engine is so that we can move of mayor air much easier. Here's the last design, and you can find engines that use this design today where the combustion chamber is really built into the top of the piston. All the air and fuel gets compressed in the piston, and the cylinder head is more of a flat design. Now today, Volkswagen and Audi have some engines that use this. And there are some diesel designs that have this combustion chamber in the piston as well. Here's a picture of a cylinder head that does not have a combustion chamber 
All it has is our two valves, an intake, big, big one's the intake, the little one's the exhaust, and the combustion chamber would be in the top of the piston in this type of a design. <clears throat> All right, now we're gonna look at some of the layouts of the engines. <clears throat> this is a traditional V6 engine. Um, V6s are very common today, and basically, they're, they have two bank angles for most V6s. They'll either be a 60 degree between this bank of pistons and this bank of pistons will be a 60 degree angle, or it will be a 90 degree angle. Okay, those are the traditional V6s. And you'll notice that the cylinders don't line up directly across from each other. They're staggered a little bit, okay? Um, and that's very typical of any V engine. I'm going to show you now something that's not traditional. Here is a Volkswagen. Volkswagen makes what they call a VR6 engine. And this is it's still considered a V6, but the bank angle between the two banks of cylinders that form the V, you see this big, big V here. Um, it's only 15 degrees. <clears throat> when what that does is if you look over here on the left, it makes the, the top of the engine very narrow, and we still have the, the cylinder staggered from each other. And what this does for this style of an engine is we only need one cylinder head that will cover all six, all six uh, cylinders at one time. It'll take care of all six. And so uh, the traditional V6, this one here would require two cylinder heads, one here and one here, where this Volkswagen has now got just one cylinder head. We can eliminate parts. Here's a traditional V12. Now, there aren't many cars and trucks today that use V12 engines. We did use some V10s recently in some of the Ford and G. Uh, no, Chrysler used a V10 engine in some of their trucks. But this is a V12, traditional. You have six cylinders on one side, and on the other side here, another six cylinders. But here is a design that's not so traditional. Another 12-cylinder engine. And we have six cylinders on one side, covered by one cylinder head, and six cylinders on the other side, covered by another cylinder head. So we can build that same 12 cylinder engine, but we have a much shorter engine. If you look how short this block is from end to end, and look at how long this thing is, this is huge. Um, you can see the advantages of doing this. Now who is doing this today? Who would be building an engine like this? Can anybody tell me? This is this current, by the way. There are cars, there are cars running around with an engine just like this today. Can anybody guess who might be making this engine? Nobody's got a guess. <clears throat> How about uh, Bentley or Bugatti? Bentley, Bugatti. Um, Audis use, uh, some of the high-end Audis use something very similar to this in an eight-cylinder configuration. Um, so, yeah, there are, there are more ways to skin the cat. This makes a very complicated engine, but it makes it also very short and compact and uh, easy to package in a small engine compartment. All right, so... Engine classifications, there are lots of different ways to classify an engine. We can look at the number of strokes, how we arrange the cylinders, how we mount them, how we deliver fuel, what type of ignition system. Through the years, we've, uh, we've uh, put a lot of different, we've classified engines in different ways. Okay. In this class, we're only going to talk about the four-stroke auto cycle engine we're gonna we'll talk a little 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 bit about diesel engines but we're gonna concentrate on gasoline engines remember that the four stroke engine takes two complete crankshaft revolutions to get all 
four strokes to happen, and we'll call that one complete cycle. That is a question that you're going to see on quizzes and on, again on the final exam, and I'm, it's pretty important that you know it takes two revolutions. It does not matter how many cylinders are in the engine. If the crankshaft turns two full times, the engine, every cylinder in that engine will complete all four strokes in two revolutions. Doesn't matter how many cylinders are in the engine. They are all timed, they're all spaced apart so that they don't all happen at the same time, but all it takes is two revolutions of the crankshaft and all the cylinders will do all four strokes. <clears throat> okay, there are three basic engine block, block designs, inline engine, a horizontally opposed engine, or a V engine. V8s, V6s, V4s. World War II aircraft used a design called a radial engine. And here's a picture of a motorcycle. I, I, I wouldn't, I don't think I would want to ride it very far, but this is an aircraft engine. It's a radial design and the cylinders, these are the cylinders here, are radially placed all the way around a common crankshaft in the middle. Now that worked really well for aircraft, but it, 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 and it makes an interesting looking motorcycle, but probably not very practical to ride. I don't think I would want to ride this motorcycle very far. It would be really cool to ride it maybe once, but I don't think it would be very practical. All right, I bring that up just because that's a little bit of trivia. Okay, what we're looking at here is an inline engine. Pictured at the top is an inline four. What that means is the pistons are all in a line. And you'll notice that the, the two end pistons are at the top and the two middle pistons are at the bottom. And that is typical of a four cylinder engine. The, uh, these pistons will come up to the top and these two pistons will travel back down. Note that the, the one piston here at the top and this piston at the top are not on the same stroke. One will be on the compression stroke, and the other will be on the exhaust stroke. Okay, so they they will they'll not be on the same. They're not doing the same thing at the same time. Again, we space that out. This at the bottom. This picture is an inline six cylinder engine. It has six cylinders that are all lined up in a row. Think of this same engine here at the top with two more pistons at the other ends. And you can see that the pistons kind of just trade places. Any of you who are who like uh, Subaru, or maybe if you like Porsche, I like Porsches. Porsches are pretty cool, high performance supercars. Uh, Porsche and Subaru both use this style of an engine. And the cylinders are laid out in a horizontal pattern where you've got one bank of cylinders that go here to the left and another bank that go to the right. And we call this a horizontally opposed engine, also known as a boxer engine. And it makes a wide engine, but it also makes the engine very low to the ground. The oil pan is very shallow and it places the weight because the engine is kind of the, one of the heavier components of the car, it places the weight very low in the chassis, which helps uh, handling. And Porsche has figured this out because they put their engine in the back of the car, right over the drive wheels, and it sits very, very low in the chassis. Consequently, Porsches have superior handling. Uh, they go around corners really, really well because of this, uh, the fact of uh, the way they've placed the engine. They've designed it and placed it to take advantage of uh, where we put the weight in the car. <clears throat> Here is a typical V engine. Of a, a V engine, uh, typical, or you can see is a 60 degree bank angle. From here to here is 60 degrees. 
formed by the center line of the cylinders. And then you can also see 90 degree. Most V8 engines are a 90 degree design. Okay, this is a 60 degree, this is a 90. You can see that it's just a little bit wider. Okay, we'll keep going here. Uh, over square and under square. Here we go. Here's a, a this, you will not find this in the textbook. Mr. Halderman, your, your author, does not mention this in his textbook. Uh, over square and under square engines. And the uh, we need to talk about bore and stroke for just a second, and then we'll come back in, to talk to this. I'm going to move my camera a little bit. You can see me a little bit better. <clears throat> Let's talk about the piston. The piston, the size of the piston. The diameter of the piston is the bore of the engine. And when we talk about displacement or we talk about uh, over and under square, we need to talk about the bore size. What's the diameter in inches or millimeters? Okay. The stroke of the engine is how far does it take to get from TDC to BDC? How far does this piston move up and down the the cylinder, and that is in inches or in millimeters. You need to know those, the bore and the stroke, to calculate displacement and to determine whether it's over square or under square. Okay, so let's go back to talk about over square and under square. All right, when the bore is larger in measurement than the stroke, we call that an over square engine. When the bore is smaller than the stroke, we call that an under square engine. <coughs> what, what difference does that make? Well, over square engines, make good high speed engines they they operate very very well at higher engine speeds and they um they 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 make very good automotive engines um there are some automotive engines that are under square but for the most part the majority of engines today are over square it means they have big pistons but the pistons don't move up and down very far Engines that have small bore sizes and, and long strokes make much better low speed engines, like tractor engines, like generator engines, like um, engines that are going to be run at a constant speed, run very good with um, this undersquare design. So let's take a look at this next here is I have an example of an engine. This is a real engine that exists. It has a bore size of 3.870. And the piston moves up and down in the cylinder of four inches, 4.250. That's four and a quarter. Moves up and down four and a quarter inches, but it's only 3.87 in diameter. So is this engine over square or under square? <clears throat> anybody? Is anybody still there? It's under um, square. Under it's square. under square. Yes, this is a this is a real engine that would Oldsmobile used many years ago, and it is an under square engine. Okay. Here's another example. A Ford 4.9 liter engine, that's a modern engine, has a bore size of four inches, so it's got a four inch piston in it, and a stroke of 3.980. Is this engine over square or under square? Over. It's over. Over square. square. Yes, correct. Ding, 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 ding. You get a prize. All right. Here's another engine, 
A 502 big block Chevrolet engine has a bore size of 4.466 and a 4-inch stroke. Over square or under square? Over, over square. Correct. Over square. Okay. Over square engines make great high speed engines. Um, they breathe air. They get air in very good. The air comes in and out better when the bore size is big. Um, a lot of good things happen, but they don't necessarily make good industrial engines. The most of the industrial engines, tractor engines, constant speed engines tend to be under square. But one of the things that you'll learn about the engines in my class is that it doesn't matter whether it's in a forklift, a tractor, a car, a truck, engines all operate the same. And what you learn today in my class about automotive engines will translate to any engine you want to work on. The principles are all the same. So when you're learning about Car engines, you're really learning about boat engines and tractor engines and everything, anything else that, that burns gasoline. Okay. <clears throat> um, we're going to kind of bounce along here because I, I want to move on. I'm going to stop the, that share. I want to move on, but I, I really need to talk about engine displacement. I'm going to run through a couple calculations on engine displacement um, so that you uh, are comfortable with it. I had some questions on it, and when we need to. Uh, okay. Can you see my camera? Share screen. Why? Stop share. Hmm. Oh, well, there we go. Had a little bit of a brain fart for a second. We're going to step through some uh, engine displacement calculations. That's one of the exercises I'm having you do. I got to get my tripod set up here. All right. Oh, let's see. No, you can't see me very well. I need to turn that light back on. All right. The, uh, the formula for engine displacement is bore. Can you see that? No, you need to adjust your camera a little bit. I'm catching a lot of glare. I'm catching a lot of glare off the lights. That will bore times bore times stroke times point seven eight five four equals one cylinder. If we multiply that times the number of cylinders, we get total equals total displacement.
Can you see that? Yeah, it's just backwards. It's backwards? Really? All right. Well, we can fix that, I think. More. Here we go. Video settings. Can you see it correctly now? No, it's still the same backwards. It's still backwards. Yeah. Can you flip your light board around? No. Uh, I'm supposed. I should be able to do this with the. Uh, with the video settings and just invert the mirror my image. Oh, darn it. This isn't going to work then. Because I see it correctly on my screen, but you don't see it correctly? No, it's, it's backwards. I can read backwards, but I don't know if other students can. All right. Well, I'm going to have to I'm going to have to work on this and figure it out. Um, we can flip it around. Now, can you read it correctly? Yeah. Okay. Four times four times stroke times seven eight five four. The, the hardest thing to remember here is this is the magic number. You got to remember the 7854, and then that gives you one cylinder. Now, you ask, where does this number come from? Well, there's another formula. If you remember back to geometry class, I don't know how many of you took geometry. We learned about a number called pi, and pi is 3.1415, okay? Well, that's pi, because if we use, we got to have the radius instead of the bore size. It's it's r uh, pi r squared uh, is the formula for a cylinder. Well, basically, we boiled it down and made it a real simple formula, but that represents pi. So the size of the diameter of the bore times the diameter of the bore times how far the piston goes up and down times this number equals one cylinder. We multiply it by the V by four for a four cylinder, by six for a six cylinder, by eight for an eight cylinder, and we end up with the whole displacement for the whole engine. So let's do an example. Let's say we have a, a, an engine that has a four inch bore and a three inch stroke. So this is the bore, and this is the stroke. We'll do a calculation. It'll be 4.0 times 4.0 times 3.0. There's bore, bore, stroke, times 0.7854. Now, if we do the math, I'll get my handy-dandy calculator out. 4 times 4 times 3 times 0.7854 equals 37.7. Now, these are all inches. 37.7. Point, uh, 37.7 inches cubed or cubic inches. Now, if this is a V8 engine, I need to multiply that 37.7 times 8 because that's just one, this is just one cylinder. Multiply by 8, and we end up with 301.7. Inches cubed, cubic inches. Okay, this what this ends up being is it rounds up 
to a 302, which is a common Ford engine, and GM also made a, a 302 inch engine. Now, the interesting thing you need to remember about computing um, displacement is if I use inches, I cannot mix inches and millimeters. Can't do that. You either have to be all in metric or all in standard. But if I use inches, my result is always in cubic inches. If I use millimeters, my result will come in cubic millimeters, which is easy to convert into liters or milliliters. Okay, it, but the result, if you use metric, your result will automatically be metric. If you use inches, your result will automatically be in inches. Okay, just, that's just kind of the way the formula works. But the hardest part is to remember is this 0.7854 for your calculations. Now, this is something that, uh, that you need to know before you leave the class is I need you to be able to calculate the displacement of an engine. So you kind of need to memorize this bore times bore times stroke formula. Okay? So that's, uh, that's displacement. Any, any questions? There is an exercise out there. Some of you have already turned it in on calculating engine displacement. So it's, it's something that, that uh, I'm going to ask you to be able to do. It's something that um, I am going to test you on. Okay, You're going to see that in quizzes, tests. Uh, it'll be on the final exam. I promise you it'll be on the final exam. So it's something that, that I think is important that, um, that I'm going to ask you to know. All right. <clears throat> so what time is it? It is, okay, we've got some time. I'm going to try and keep this down to an uh, hour and a half today. Um, I do have one more thing that, we, that I need to, to work with you on. And that is engine. The last thing we're going to do is touch on engine condition. And I need to get back to sharing my screen. All right. We need to be able to tell what's wrong with an engine. It's pretty important, um, and as a technician, um, if you can become good at diagnosing what's wrong and be able to figure it out quickly, you'll be able to fix it quickly, and you'll be able to make lots of money. If you take a lot of time trying to figure out what's wrong, well, you won't make as much money. So being good at diagnosing problems is the key to making good money as a technician. The, the quicker you can diagnose it, the more money you're going to make. Okay? Okay, we need, we need some very, there are four tests that are very, very useful. Some of you have already done these tests, um, and some of you are about to do these tests. We, last night, we, uh, several of us went through a lot of these. And here they are. The first one is the power balance test. The second is the cranking compression test. The third one is the cylinder leak down test. And then the fourth one is the running compression test. So what do these things tell us? Um, let's see if I can make that work. Can you see the... Uh, we're not going to play this one. This one's going to be way too long. The cylinder power balance test, uh, what we want to do is we want to take our running engine and one cylinder at a time, we want to short that cylinder out so that the cylinder doesn't do anything. It, it'll still bring in air, it'll still try to compress it, but it won't run on that cylinder. And there's several ways that we can approach this. Um, we can 
For instance, if we can stop the fuel flow by unplugging the fuel injector, that means that there will be nothing but air coming into the cylinder and the cylinder won't fire. And when we do that to a cylinder, the engine should run a little bit rough and the engine speed should drop down because that cylinder is no longer doing anything. And what we're trying to do here with this test is determine, is the cylinder we're looking at doing anything? Because if we short it out and nothing changes, well, we know that it should. Okay, we know that it should start running rough. We know it should slow down. And if we short out a cylinder and nothing happens, it runs the same. We've identified the cylinder that has the problem. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take an engine and we're going to short out one cylinder at a time until we find the one cylinder that nothing happens when we short it out. If it doesn't do something different, that's the cylinder with the problem. So this is kind of a, a series of eliminations. We're going to keep shorting out a cylinder until we find one that doesn't do anything. <clears throat> Now, there's several ways that we can make the, the engine stop running on that cylinder. Un, uh, disconnecting the fueled injector is only one way. The other way would be to disable the ignition coil, the, the part that makes the spark. By unplugging the, if, if, if each cylinder has its own coil, that makes it easy. All we have to do is unplug that coil and then the coil won't fire, and it will misfire on that cylinder. So it makes it, rel using the ignition system, makes it relatively easy to perform. You don't have to disassemble a lot of stuff to do that. Maybe take the cover off the top. And it can often be done with a scan tool. And that's what those who did it last night saw that we, we did use a scan tool to make this happen in class. Those of you who've already done the vacuum testing, uh, which was last week, you noticed that all we did was unplug a spark plug coil, uh, ignition coil, to make the misfire happen. And it would be the same thing. We could do, do it that way and not use a scan tool at all. The problem is, is the disadvantages of, of the power balance test is, yep, okay, we know what cylinder now has the problem but we don't know exactly what the problem is. We, we know where, but we don't know what. Why is it not running right on that cylinder? There are other tests that will tell us, uh, uh, help us figure out what's wrong and what we're going to be fixing. And the next test in line would be the cranking compression test. Now, I like to come into the cranking compression test before I do my cranking compression test. I, I already want to know what cylinder I think the problem is on. And then all I have to do is test that cylinder and maybe something next to it that I think is good. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove all the spark plugs from the engine. We are going to disable the fuel or the ignition and the ignition system. Um, the battery needs to be fully charged when we do this. We're going to remove all the spark plugs, disable ignition, block the throttle wide open, install a gauge into one cylinder, and then crank the engine. Okay, The pressure gauge is going to record the highest pressure that it sees, and then we're going to compare cylinder to cylinder. We're going to do this in each cylinder, and then we're going to find the, per the cylinder that has the lowest compression. Now, they should all be within 10% of each other. If they're not, that indicates a problem, and that's what we're going to be trying to fix. Okay, We will also add a little bit of oil to the cylinder because that helps these piston rings seal up. And adding a little bit of oil, we call that a wet compression test. <clears throat> Here is a picture of the tool and the end of the tool that screws you, you're going to put this in place of the spark plug. And then here's a technician hat with the tool installed in the engine. And 
He's now going to have somebody crank the engine for him. We'll wait to see the needle jump up four times, and then we'll record the highest pressure that we see. Okay, so that's compression testing. <clears throat> Leak down testing is a little bit different. It's we're also going to use we're going to assess the cylinder to see if it's leaking, but we're going to use com compressed shop air. We're going to we're going to inject shop air into the cylinder. We're not going to run the engine. We are going to take all the spark plugs out of the engine. But we're going to pressurize the cylinder and see where does it come out. So does it come out? And it, and where if it does come out, where does it come out? Because that'll tell us what's wrong. Okay. Um, unfortunately, I don't have a picture, but I do have a leak down test video built into Canvas. I want you to take a look and when you're going through the Canvas module, look at the leak down testing. There's a really good video put out by another community college instructor, and she shows you how to do a leak down test. Um, and basically, if you hear the air leaking out of the cylinder, you can listen and determine where does it leak. Like if I hear it leaking through the tailpipe of the car, I know it's the exhaust valve. Or if I hear it through the air cleaner, it's the intake valve. If I listen, if I pull the oil fill off the cap off the valve cover and listen and I hear it there, it's a piston ring. And if I list, if I look in the cooling system and I see bulb air bubbles coming out through the cooling system, that probably means I have a bad head gasket because that's allowing the air out of the cylinder and getting into the cooling system. So th this leak down testing is very valuable because it doesn't just tell us that, hey, we're low on compression or tell us what cylinder. It's more specific. It says, hey, you've got a problem and it's an exhaust valve or it's a head gasket that's what you're that's what you know you're going to be doing so that's a real good thing the running compression test is another test that you're going to do in class or you've already done and we typically do that in one cylinder at a time the engine does run and it is very good to find broken valve springs or weak valve springs um, uh, a test that can't, you really can't find a valve, broken valve spring any other way. So this is a test that you're going to learn to do in class. And there are some other useful diagnostic tests, such as the vacuum test, which you should have already done in class. The paper test, which is described in your textbook. The exhaust back pressure test. We're testing to see that the exhaust system is not restricted, plugged up because that does happen in a lot of cars and trucks. Um, and sometimes it is difficult for a technician to figure out. Exhaust back pressure testing and vacuum testing work together. And then the last one, we've already done this one in class, is testing oil pressure in an engine. Okay, the vacuum test, well, a lot of different things happen to the vacuum gauge when different engine defects happen. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and go through every one of them. As a matter of fact, I gave you all a handout from Snap-on that pretty much describes all these different vacuum conditions that can happen in an engine. And uh, I'm not going to ask you to memorize that. However, it's good reference material that when you do have to diagnose an engine problem, that, hey, Maybe I'll start with a vacuum test, or maybe I'll start with a power balance test and then do the vacuum test. And that'll tell me a little bit about the engine. I like the vacuum test because it's very easy to hook up. I don't have to take much apart in order to hook up a vacuum gauge and read in intake manifold vacuum. And it can tell me an awful lot. So it's a good test to do uh, before you decide what's really wrong. Okay, the paper test, here's a picture. Uh, the, the book talks about this. You'll take a piece of regular notebook paper and hold it up to the tailpipe with the engine running. <clears throat> a good running engine will push the paper away. An engine that has an exhaust valve problem or an intake valve problem may try to suck the paper up 
to the tailpipe. And believe it or not, this is a good test. This works, and it will find uh, burned valves or valves that are not sealing. So uh, don't overlook this one. Um, we talk about that, the hose trick. Yep, oil pressure testing um, inside the engine. Uh, clearances inside the engine will affect oil pressure and a good oil pump. Uh, a pump that's worn out or damaged may not produce the pressure. And we saw this in class. You, you found out how to find the specifications. A low oil pressure can be caused by, by bearings that are worn out inside the engine, by a damaged or worn oil pump, or by something damaged in the pressure relief system inside the pump. Um, these are all things that can happen. We will talk more about the pressure relief system when we talk about lubrication systems. In the near future, we'll be talking about oiling systems, and we'll get into how does that oil uh, pressure relief valve work. Oil pressure testing should always be done with a mechanical gauge. If you suspect, if there's a problem with the gauge in the dash, you should always verify that the mechanical gauge agrees with the, the dash gauge. Um, don't trust the gauge in the dash. Always trust a good mechanical gauge. So if you think there's an oil pressure problem, use a mechanical gauge, remove the sending unit. The sending unit would go here. Uh, the electrical sending unit comes out, the gauge attaches, and then run the engine. Remember that when the oil warms up, it thins out. And as the oil thins out, the pressure drops. All right, we're going to keep going here. And the last thing we want to talk about for diagnosis is, is oil leaks. Uh, <clears throat> as a, a beginning technician, you will be asked, your service managers, your bosses are going to ask you, they're going to start you out by fixing oil leaks. That's usually where most novice technicians start is, okay, I got this engine oil leak. Go figure out where it's leaking and fix the leak. And this is pretty typical. You find an engine that looks like this. It's got oil everywhere, and you got to figure it out. Now, you don't want to go sealing up everything, and you don't want to try and fix something that isn't leaking. The problem when you see a mess like this is, I can't tell where it's leaking because it's so covered with oil. So the best approach was when you see something like this is let's clean it off. Let's use uh, some degreaser, uh, some brake clean, a brush, a pressure washer, whatever it takes is get this gunk off of there first. Let's get it clean and then let's run the engine again. And then I can tell exactly where is the oil getting out, and then I know what to fix. Okay, if you don't clean it off, you're guessing. And guessing always gets expensive. All right, so what else can we do? And let's see. One of the tricks that I learned from one of my technicians was he would use flour, regular old baking flour. He would take a small quantity of flour and a blow gun, an air gun, and he would clean off this area and he would blow the, with a small amount with the air gun, he would blow the dust onto the surface that he thinks is leaking. Now it's, you know, the flour is white and oil is usually dark colored and the minute that the oil leaked or even seeped out a little bit, that white flour turns dark immediately. So it makes it very, very easy to figure out where's the oil coming out. Um, very cheap. A bag of flour at the local grocery store is pennies compared to any other method of finding a leak. And I'll tell you, it's very effective. The other way that you can do this is they make fluorescent additives that you can add to the engine oil. 
you put the uh, the additive in the uh, the crankcase with the oil. It circulates with the oil, and you look for the leak using a black light. And I'm trying to see if I have any of the leak dye in my cabinet, and I don't see any to show you, so I'm not going to be able to show you what the bottle looks like, but there are little tiny bottles that are only an ounce or two of the fluorescent dye, and then all we do is run the engine and then look for traces of the glow-in-the-dark dye, and that will tell us where our leak is at. So finding and fixing leaks is a big deal for an engine technician because that's one of the more common repairs that you will do. And there's money to be made. There's, there's a good, good living to be made doing this type of work. Okay, it's nearly impossible to tell where the leak is coming from until you get it clean. Pressure wash it, clean it with engine cleaner and a hose, use brake clean, blow the area dry with, a, with an air hose, uh, before you try and figure out exactly where is the leaks coming from. Of course, what's leaking is always a good question. Is it engine oil? Is it antifreeze? Is it ATF, automatic transmission fluid? Is it brake fluid? Is it air conditioning oil? Or is it water coming out the air conditioning uh, evaporator, which is normal? Or it could be power steering fluid. And they all have their own colors. They all have their own signatures. Um, so you might want to look to see what color is the oil coming out before you dive into the engine, because it might be a transmission leak. OK, <laughs> we talked about that. And I am done speaking about engine oil leaks. I'm going to stop my share. And I will open the discussion up if you have a question. Now is the, a good time to ask. Um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to, like to ask? Any, any questions about the, the, uh, the presentation today? Uh, professor, it's Justin. I have a question. Go, go ahead, Justin. Um, it's about the overbore and underbore. Um, yeah, over when, square and under square. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. When that would be important to know, um, if there's any like main reason why you would want to know that when working on an engine. Well, let's say we're modifying of an Oldsmobile V8, and we want to we want more power, or 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 maybe we had the choice. We have several different Oldsmobile V8s. And we want to pick the one that uh, has the most over-square design because we know that that's going to be a better, stronger, more hot rod engine. By comparing bores and strokes, you might, be, uh, you might find that one's better than the other. All right. And the next, I just have another qu quick question. Um, why is it for cranks of the engine to test for cranking compression okay it it takes four good puffs in other words we're going to make actually the the crankshaft is going to make eight revolutions it's going to come up on the compression stroke four times um to get a good reading because the the first the first couple of puffs that it doesn't get to its full pressure yet um Justin, were you did did you come last night? Yeah, I did those already. So you've done it. You saw that the first time the 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 first puff the needle doesn't go all the way up. Yeah, it it takes a good four puffs for the rings to seal up and uh, the, to get a good assessment of what's going on in the cylinder. One or two is not enough, and and anything more than four is just kind of a waste of time. Okay. That makes sense to you? Yep, that's all. Okay. Four good puffs on a compression test is what I like to. Could you get away with three? Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't want to just do two. Uh, five, six, seven, don't need that many. You okay. just run the starter needlessly at that point. Okay? But, but those are good questions. Um, and obviously, you've done it, so you know. Uh, for those who have not done it yet, 
uh, you'll understand Justin's question better when you come to class and we do it. Some of you will be doing it this Thursday night and some of it will be doing it next Tuesday or next Thursday. So we'll, we'll get that out of the way and everybody will have their, their chance at uh, learning about these various compression tests that we did. Any other questions? All right. Well, if I don't have any other questions, I will end the session. Uh, the video link to this will be available in case you want to review it. Uh, I'll have it out on Canvas so that uh, the people who are not able to attend today uh, can see that. I uh, appreciate you participating. And uh, if you have any other questions, that you think about afterwards, don't hesitate to send me an email or uh, give me a, a text message, and I'll be glad to uh, try and explain whatever it is that you, you need to know. All right, thanks for attending. We will, we will talk again uh, next week at the same time. Again, every Wednesday from 1 till about 2, 2.30 is when we're going to uh, host the engine conference. Uh, I'm doing a breaks conference in the, the Wednesday mornings. So have a great day, and we will talk to you soon. Bye now. <clears throat>